Hello, welcome to today's session on trichromatic vision. This discussion on trichromatic vision will be a continuation of our earlier discussion on color perception. Trichromatic, as you will see, will mean that we have three different cone types and we'll be discussing today what are the implications of having three different cone types and we'll consider some hypothetical cases of animals that might have just one cone type, a monochromat, or two cone types, a dichromat. So let's jump right in and have our conversation. Again, trichromatic refers to three tri types of cones or photopigments. Chroma is corresponding to color, so for trichromatic we have three cone types. There are other animals that have more than three uh, cone types. Uh, some birds, for example, have four cone types, so they would not be trichromatic. Um, but we are trichromatic uh, as a species, generally speaking. Okay. Trichromatic vision is the only branch of science where the quality of human experience can be traced directly to a short DNA sequence on a single chromosome. That statement was a very powerful statement, true probably 10 years ago. I, I put it here partly to uh, show you that a lot is known about the genetics of color vision and that we can go from the arrangement of genes on a particular chromosome to being able to specify very precisely how that person will uh, experience colors. Um, it might be the case that as the years roll on, and maybe to some extent already, uh, we can say that color vision is not the only branch of science for which this is true, for which we can tightly tie a subjective experience to some kind of genetic structure. But certainly we can do this with great precision in the world of color vision. Okay? So to appreciate what our three uh, cone photopigments can do, we'll first consider what it might be like if we had just one or two photopigments. So we'll start out with the case of a so-called monochromat. This is a hypothetical animal, and we'll see in a moment, maybe not so hypothetical, but for, for just here, we'll say a hypothetical animal that has just one kind of uh, photopigment in their visual system. This is a monochromat, okay? And this layout, uh, I'd like to set up now because we're gonna come back to this time and time again in today's pr presentation. Here we have the percentage of light absorbed on our y-axis. And if we can think for a moment back to our earlier conversations about photopigments absorbing light, you might think of them as catching photons. In our classroom demonstration, we had a student catch a, a wiffle ball, and then we also had that wiffle ball bounce off of the back wall and try to catch it on the bounce. Our photopigments are catching photons through their cis-trans isomerization, as we've mentioned before. We sometimes refer to photons as quanta, and we sometimes refer to this process of catching photons, the cis-trans isomerization of catching photons or quanta as the quantal catch. So we have on this axis how much light is being caught by our photons. And over here, we have the different wavelengths of light as we've seen fairly recently, going from 400 to 700 nanometers of light. On this graph, we have a diagram of the spectral sensitivity of a hypothetical monochromat. By spectral sensitivity, we might remind ourselves that we're talking about the particular portions of this spectrum to which this photopigment is particularly sensitive. Okay, so we can talk about uh, having a peak sensitivity somewhere between wavelengths A and B. Okay, it looks almost like a bell curve for this particular photopigment. This photopigment absorbs uh, two times more light at B than at A, maybe 50 versus 25% using rough numbers. So here's wavelength A, Okay. And we'll go just a little bit to this side. We can see that arrow over here is pointing to maybe 25 or so approximately. And then the corresponding uh, value here at B is going to be approximately 50% of the light. Okay. So we're absorbing more light because this axis is in the percentage of light absorbed at this wavelength than we are at that wavelength. Okay. So this has some very interesting perceptual consequences. If lights A and B were presented at equal intensity, the response to B would be two times larger than to A, as we saw just a moment ago, 50 versus 25, to use some round numbers. However, the response to A and B could be made equal by doubling the intensity of light A. Okay? And here we have just a little bit of simple arithmetic to understand why that's the case. So for example, you could have 200 units of light at wavelength A, so that would be 200 units of light at wavelength A times the 25% quantal catch rate, or the absorption rate. So 200 times 25 would give us 50 units of light absorbed at wavelength A. Okay. Hang on to that number, 50 units of light absorbed. We also could have 100 units of light at wavelength B. So here's 100 units of light, 
times its absorption rate of 50%, its quantal catch rate of 50%, that will again give us 50 units of light absorbed. Okay? So what this shows us is that this one pigment system can't reliably distinguish changes in wavelength from changes in intensity. Okay? Therefore, it would generate metamers. Recall that metamers are physically different stimuli that are perceptually indistinguishable. And what this demonstration shows us is that this one pigment system would not really be good at distinguishing wavelength differences on the one hand from intensity differences on, another, on the other hand. Okay. Okay. So a person with a one pigment system can't discriminate wavelengths and is called a monochromat. Now, to a monochromat, changes in light, maybe something like changes in the wavelength of light, moving from wavelength A over to wavelength B, uh, a trichromat might experience that as a color shift, but a monochromat might experience that simply as a change in gray level. Maybe uh, things will look like a lighter gray at wavelength B, and maybe as a darker gray at wavelength A, if they're absorbing more light at B than at A. Okay? So humans, like you and me, actually are monochromatic in certain kinds of lighting conditions. We might call these scotopic lighting conditions, and that's a fancy phrase for lighting conditions at which only our rods are operating. Remember that rods have rhodopsin, and rhodopsin is relatively sensitive to light. Rhodopsin might engage in a cis-trans isomerization to very, very low levels of light where there are just few photons, whereas our cones, our cone opsins, tend to be a little bit less sensitive. They would need more photons before they engage in a cis-trans isomerization. Okay? So when you and I are in extremely low light levels, only our rods might be operating. We call these scotopic conditions, conditions under which only our rods are operating. And because we only have one type of rhodopsin in our particular species, we are essentially monochromatic. This is why I suggested earlier that it's not all that hypothetical that uh, you and I would be monochromatic. We are, in general, trichromats. Under particular conditions, we could be rendered monochromatic. So we've talked about this monochromatic animal, which could be hypothetical, or it could be us in scotopic conditions. Let's now go up one notch from a monochromatic system to a dichromatic system, a two-pigment system. So here on this plot, we have a two-pigment system, and the two pigments are going to be called pigment 1 and pigment 2, but everything else remains the same. We still have the percentage of light absorbed, the quantal catch in our cis-trans isomerization, the wavelength distribution from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, and we can see that pigment 1 and pigment 2 in this dichromatic system, they have different peak sensitivities, different spectral sensitivities, with pigment 2 preferring longer wavelengths, pigment 1 preferring shorter wavelengths. Okay? So the pair of responses to stimulation near A, so let's say we have a wavelength that we're going to present in our psychophysical experiment, near wavelength A on the spectrum. We're going to get some response from pigment number 2, it'll be that level of responding, and we'll get some level of response from pigment number 1, but as you can see here for pigment A, we're getting more absorption from pigment, uh, I'm sorry, at, at wavelength A, pardon me, at wavelength A, we're getting more absorption from pigment 1 than we are from pigment 2, so pigment 1 is exceeding pigment 2. And that differs from the pair of responses that we're going to get at something like 600 nanometers. So over here in red, I've now moved to a longer wavelength. I now put up this new stimulus, and I'm still going to get some response out of pigment 1, but it's a very low level of responding. I'm also going to get a much higher level of responding uh, from pigment number 2. So now pigment 1 is less than in pigment number 2. So I get different pairs of responses to these different kinds of, of lights. Okay. So unlike the monochromatic person that we entertained a moment ago, a two-pigment system can discriminate wavelengths. We call these folks dichromatic. Okay. Except monkeys, apes, and humans, all mammals are, uh, that are known to have more than one cone pigment are dichromats. So most mammals are dichromatic. Some common examples, your dog is dichromatic, your cat is dichromatic. They might have slightly different cone sensitivities, but any, either of those animals will be a, a dichromat. Although dichromats are not colorblind in the same sense that a monochromat would be, dichromats are very vulnerable to color metamers. And we'll see if we can uh, describe why that's the case. So I'll ask you now to dial back with me one time to this particular diagram, and we're going to see if we can generate some metamers. Remember that these are physically different stimuli that are perceptually indistinguishable. And we will see how easy it is to fool a dichromat 
um, by way of metamer. So let's first remind ourselves of what broadband white, white light would be composed of. It would be composed of the full range of all possible wavelengths that we might be able to see. So if we had a very broadband stimulus with this rectangular kind of distribution, we would get a lot of firing from pigment number one. We would get a lot of firing from pigment number two because those bent, uh, peak sensitivities are falling within this full range. So we're getting full firing from one and two. One and two would be at the same ratio. We'd have as much from pigment one as we have as from pigment two, and the psychological experience would be white. That's one stimulus condition. Let's now look at a very different stimulus condition. Instead of having the full range of broadband light, let's use a very well-selected monochromatic laser right here. Maybe I'll call it something like 520 nanometers, something like that. When I put that light up, I get a certain level of responding from pigment 2 that is identical to the level of responding from pigment 1. Now, once again, I have pigment 1 and pigment 2 firing at exactly the same rates or absorbing exactly the same amount of light, just as was the case when I had the broadband light. To this animal, then, this laser at this neutral point, said to be neutral because pigments 1 and 2 are firing at the same rate, their response to that neutral point will be exactly the same as a response to this broadband light. So that it would be easy to fool this dichromatic animal into thinking it was looking at white light when in fact it was looking at a single laser. And those stimuli couldn't be more different from each other. A clear case of metamers, physically different stimuli, being perceptually indistinguishable. Just to remind us, we ourselves are somewhat vulnerable to this, but less so. Be Oops, pardon me. Because we have three different cone types, pardon me, we are still vulnerable on some level to metamers, but to a much lesser extent. Uh, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're seeing white, as we are, we're seeing here, but we actually couldn't do that just by having a single light source at one neutral point. We'd actually need the confluence of three very specifically selected different wavelengths that would converge to give us the same kind of arrangement of firing that we saw in the dichromatic animal. So what I'd like you to do is uh, stop the video and make some notes to yourselves about what was particularly clear in this lecture on trichromatic vision and what remains unclear. I look forward to your questions in class. See you in class.